Welcome back to Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast, presented by Zwift. We haven't had a normal race recap for what feels like years. Oh. In fact, it's probably been like a week. I'm down in Sydney, hence the different visage behind me, where it all started on LRCP for me, in that room over there, actually, in the middle of the night. <laughs> so good and bad memories. Um <laughs> Much of the same at the moment. We're doing the UAE Tour Women's Recap, the inaugural edition, which actually had some pretty good racing, I must say, and some new things we saw because of the specificity of this parkour and terrain that exposed some weaknesses in some of these riders that we hadn't seen before and some strengths in others, uh, in particular on the Jabal Hafid stage. So four stages, three sprints, one queen stage, stage three up Jabal Hafid, the big showdown was between Lorena Vibers on the SD Works with new lead out woman Barbara Guarishi. Just so we know, Benji, is Guarishi like the Morkov? I know I don't want to compare apples to apples, but in terms of she's a really good lead out rider, but also there's an element of sketchiness in her lead outs too. Yes, yeah, certainly. As in, there was a sketchiness of, wow causing crashes. For example, last year in the first race of the season, Valenciana, she caused a crash where Consoni hit the ground because of a devious deviation. That's an alliteration for you. But does that also happen when she's leading out? We don't know that because I feel like we haven't seen her lead out as much as we saw her sprint last season. And this time around, she would have that dedicated lead out role for Lorena Wibis. And would that work? That's a big question here. Will the SD Works lead out work for Lorena Wibis? And next to that, what will Charlotte Cole be able to do at DSM without having to lead out Lorena Wibis as well? So there's two major factors here. Outside of them, Konson is here. And for example, Emma Norsgaard. So there are other sprinters here. But I'll be honest, before this race started, I was looking at two sprinters for this entire race, right? Yeah, it's the big showdown between them. And uh, Juliet Labou, if you haven't checked out that really good interview Benji did with her last Thank week, you. she she said, listen, I think Charlotte Cool is up there with Vibers. So, yeah, that's what we were closely watching for. But before we get into the action, on 18th of February, Zwift Worlds is kicking off the World Championships, 100 race riders, three races, one champion. 18th of February, it's on the Glasgow Scotland course, which I hope many of you have been testing out in the last couple of weeks. Some of the races to watch, Los Arches, who you'll remember from the TDU. Oh, no, Cadells. She won Cadells, right? Yeah. Yeah, like that's a scary prospect for the women in her race. Mary Wilkinson, Zoe Langham, Eva Van Acht, Kristen Kulczynski on the women's side, and then Lionel Vuyasin, Sam Hill, James Barnes, Freddie Yvette, Jason Osborne, who's on Alperson in the men's side. You can see it on Swift's YouTube channel. Make sure you follow Swift on Instagram. They'll have all the details closer to the date. Stage one, flat stage, Port Rashid to Dubai Harbour. It's, yeah, it's got like five turns in the whole course. (laughs) That didn't mean it was boring though, Benji. There was like, actually this stage was pretty chill um, until the (laughs) final, right? Well, it depends on whether you consider the crashes in boring or not. I don't like crashes. And a lot happened. And for example, important riders crashed. Lorena Wibis crashed herself. The sprinter that was supposed to be the leader for SD Works here at 3.8 kilometers to go. That is very close to the finish line. I can tell you that. And not only did she crash, but also three lead out riders for DSM, for Charlotte Cole. So both teams not looking that great with three 3.8 kilometers to go. But that switch towards a sprint to the point where Rivers actually got back to the front group. She cycled across, hopped back on her bike, and then made her way to that front group very quickly. The DSM leadouts didn't necessarily uh, make it back to the front, so Cole was only there with, I think, uh, Francisca Koch as final uh, lead out there because Pfeiffer Georgie was one of the riders that was uh, behind, if I recall correctly. So we were heading towards a sprint between those riders, and I felt like SD Works was the team that was able to control the final sprint, mainly because of the crash DSM riders. Or do you think they would have otherwise anyway? I, I couldn't believe it because I didn't realize Vibus had crashed because 
when you look at the tape, it's like, well, they're all up there. It all looks fine. And she didn't have, she did have a slight rip in her jersey, but it was difficult to see from the helicopter shot. And yeah, I, I was surprised they were able to take over. DSM, I think, were the strongest train in this race. We'll see that in stage two in particular, I think. But yeah, Gorishi was like SD Works sent five riders here rather than six, which was an advantage for DSM. They also didn't send Majerus, uh, Vandenbroek Black, or Royce. So this is not the best train SD Works can put together, but they did have the best lead-out rider, I think, in the race. I think Gorishi. Uh, her and Pfeiffer Georgie, I think I might take Gorishi. And that was how it sort of – I saw it today. And, yeah, cock position, cool. Gorishi finished a little bit early. Vibas launched early, but listen, in the Tour de France fam, she launched early last year, no problem, and won races by two bike lengths. And then Charlotte Cool comes from behind and absolutely ruins her yeah. in the sprint, like one easily um, coming at like twice the speed. I think this was headwind, right? This was a headwind sprint. I think we could also notice that by the fact that Guarishi was burned up so quickly. And if Ribas launches at the same exact position that she would launch when it's not a headwind, then, well, obviously the headwind is going to cause her to have more trouble finishing this. But I also feel like that crash might have hit the amount of wads that she pushed out in this sprint. Because I went to analyze the Strava of Lorena Ribas, which, like, we can guess the accuracy of their power meters, but if we compare the wads that she does in a sprint stage by stage would there be differences in the power meter there not really is so is that comparable i don't know what one she's on um but let's just say let's just say hers far are fine okay uh in stage one she did 949 watts for 10 seconds which is 200 less than she did at the tour de france femme and we'll see at stage two and stage three that it's clearly less than stage two and uh, stage four i mean so this first stage was definitely not Lorena Wibis' best sprint, but I would say that if you look at the sprint itself, Charlotte Cole basically launches from the draft of Wibis here, so I feel like Cole has an advantage in the sprint by the position that she launches in. A notable advantage, it's not 10 seconds in the draft, but it's 2-3 seconds, enough to have that slingshot past Wibis, which gives that extra. So I think in the sprint, Cole has a, an advantage over Wibis, the second they start their sprint, no? Yes, I think so. And it can be a bit misleading, these headwind sprints, because, and you'll see it in UAE sometimes, and often, like, Caleb Ewan is fast, and he's missed out on a lot of sprints the last couple of years, but he'll come finish with such speed, and he'll like, oh, my God, if he'd just been in any position at 150 to go, he would have won by five bike lengths. It's like, no, he's going that fast because he's in the draft of all the other riders moving up and Arno Damar who's been dropped off in the wind or Bauhaus who's been dropped off in the wind at yeah. Tour Down Under has been in the wind for 16 seconds so no he wasn't actually the quickest I think this was a bit of that I, I wanted to see more it's you can't draw a huge conclusion yeah. from one sprint the next day stage two huge crosswinds from the start really hard stage I think for the riders particularly uh, Marta Cavalli, she was just like any time there was crosswinds, <laughs> Insta dropped. And yeah. it's not because she doesn't have a strong team. She's got Grace Brown here, uh, Amelia Farlin, Gladys Verhulst, who was fine in the crosswinds from what I could see. So I don't know what was going on, but she wasn't just like, it wasn't like she was there holding on, struggling, and then eventually in a rotation she would get dropped it was just like the second any pace got put on the crosswinds she was just like insta spat yeah i feel like there might be a, a thing here whether it's positioning likely it's some kind of positioning issue because otherwise you don't have the insta drop but there might also be the factor that she might still be recovering from that heavy crash she had last year so is that still having a consequence towards marta cavalli that's a possibility here we don't know that, but she was so far behind. 
There was a second group as well, by the way. Cavalli is group three. Lippert was in group two. And then the first group included the likes of Cole and Rubis and so forth. But let's go further into the race, somewhere closer towards the end. 40k to go. The Lippert group is basically catching up with the front group again. So Cavalli is the only rider with a bunch of other riders that aren't too relevant to the overall GC in this race behind. Five minutes behind with 40k to go. And with 34k to go, they're back. How? How? Tell me, how, how? You, you never say if, that. If you consider Cavalli a GC tread, which at this point in the race, I would still consider, why is Trexigafredo? Why is Trexigafredo the only team that's like actively trying to keep Cavalli behind with Longo Borghini? Like, I didn't get that. But hey, it yes, happened. DSM don't have a real top GC threat. They were hoping for a decent result. Yeah. And then SD works were sort of wanting to ride for Viva's sprint and they got yeah. five riders and Shackley, you know, again, not out there. It's like a top, top GC rider. And then Movistar had just come back, but still I agree. Like it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just put two riders on the front, keep them, keep it moving. Um, everyone else should be helping too. It's like, but- it, yeah. It didn't matter because Cavalli dropped the second that something happened with 8K to go. I think it was Echelons once again, and once again, she was behind. So she lost time on this stage, but then we were heading towards a sprint where these riders have gone to a heavy crossman stage. They spend loads of kilojoules throughout this stage to keep the Echelons going because this Echelon was kept up for 100 kilometers in the stage. And then they go towards a sprint, and this is where you can talk about the, uh, about the DSM versus... SD Works situation in the sprint because at the start it looked like SD Works was having the upper hand. Well, yeah, SD Works were like in position, looking good, and then on the right side of the road, DSM I think launched at like one point two, yeah, one point three, like a freight train. It was crazy to see DSM just like full sending the whole team for Charlotte Cool, and they like literally blew everyone else out of the water. Gorishi saves the day here for Lorena Vibas. Like without Gorishi, Vibas doesn't win the sprint. It's not possible. Um, and there's a sloping right-hand bend here in this stage and in this finish rather in the last maybe 300, 400. And the DSM train doesn't fully go the barriers, which they should have. And Guarishi is able to come up on the inside and they're getting really good wind coverage. And she's actually, she ends up providing, she goes side by side with Charlotte Cool and pushes Cool a little bit off the wheel through that bend. And so Cool's not even getting perfect draft. And Vibas is sitting between two riders who are either side of her, which gives you more draft than drafting one rider. So Garishi, just insane job here. She then peels off, drops, leaves Vibas right there. And from the wheel, Vibas jumps left around the same time as Cool. Um, fair sprint. And yep. she wins pretty comfortably against Cool. And one, one each. But really interesting to see. I think DSM had the best train. But that's where I... This one was like, wow, Garishi, I think, was the best lead out rider in this race i agree with that and maybe stage four might change her mind about georgia and so forth but at this point in the race i was also like guarishi might be the rider at the end of 2023 that we say oh this is the best lead out rider this is like a good indication because the good lead out riders are the ones that can adapt to situations that happen that aren't necessarily the right things that are happening and guarishi recovered a situation that was basically a loss of a situation for Rubens into a position that Wibbles can win this stage from, and she did. Now, back to the numbers very quickly. 9.49 for 10 seconds was her sprint in stage one with the crash happening. Now, in stage two, with echelons happening throughout, happening throughout the entire stage, she gets a lot more than in stage one, which is 1,040 for 10 seconds. That's 100 watts more, both the peak and the average. And that shows to me that that crash did have an impact in stage one, like a notable impact or the energy that she needed to recover her position in stage one after crashing might have had an impact on her sprint. So here we see a better sprint by Wibbers and she, in all honesty, destroys Cole in the most head-to-head sprint of the two so far, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Cole's um, water bottle came out at the end. Now, 
listen, a lot of these finishes look the same, but I'm testing my <laughs> um, Rain Man photographic memory here. Is this the finish Vanderpool won after the crosswind action in 2021 stage one ahead of David Decker and, and Morkov? I look I to me like the same sweeping right-hand vent. I'll need a fact check on that. <laughs> um, I don't know. I want to go back as well on that stage. I think Benji, this is something to bear in mind. Teams should do more. I feel like some of the crosswind action on one of the stages as well might have been stage two or th- kicked off. And this is if this was the Vanderpool stage, then it's the same crosswind area, kicked off through the IS. And DSM after just after the IS. Now maybe they didn't. I don't know, but I, I feel like that's where the crosswinds kicked off on that stage. Quick step. Mm-hmm. They everyone was like, oh, they're just going for the intermediate sprint. Next minute, center child, someone's putting it in the gutter. I think it's a really good place to take teams by surprise because people people think, oh, they're just doing the lead out for the three bonus yeah. seconds. I don't need to move up. I'll just chill back here. And then there's a split, and you're off the back. Um, so that's a sneaky thing. Anyway. Stage three, the queen stage, the big one. It's a hockey stick stage, but it actually was hard before. Jabil Hafiz, 10K, 6.6%. And I need to do some some maths. But in Wounds World Tour, when you see sort of 10K, 6.6%, you need to think of that stage as maybe equivalent to being 7.6% or an 8% climb because the speed is a few kph lower so then the draft effect is less so then it can be more selective so a five six percent extended climb like that can be yeah. really really selective rather than a small group sprint you might see in men's feet so this is a hard climb this is one of the hardest finishes we'll see in women's world tour and it was selective the crosswinds though like were f- <laughs> like nasty all day it's a copy paste. It's a copy paste. Cavalli is the first rider behind the way the group. And then the next group that is close to Hafid already is Lippert falling behind together with Merino as well in that group, Claire Steele. So quite a few decent climbers also behind. But Cavalli's group was just out of the picture. Like Cavalli's out of GC at this point, too far behind. This ain't happening. But Lippert's group kept it up to. I think roughly a minute at the foot of Jabel yeah, Hafid. So, well, it's lost for the stage, I'd say. I didn't expect those riders to come back and obliterate anyone at the front, but I was down to see it if it happened. But um, I'll throw it to you with an odd move that I saw at the bottom of Hafid. What is well, Faulkner doing? Well, I want to I want to say that Lippert, unforgivable, actually, what happened <laughs> with her getting dropped. Like, really not great. Um it was 40 Ks to go. You can go and check out. I did a video. It's on up now on Legend Rouge channel. Um, there's two roundabouts. There's been crosswinds on all day. DSM and Trek have just been scaring the shit out of everybody through every roundabout, putting it in the gutter. <laughs> like they're not being very friendly because they're strong. Yeah. And she's at the back with five teammates chatting, eating. Like you, you've got to be top 15 wheels and Norse guard can bring you your food or someone can bring you the food. That's why you got the teammates. And then through the roundabout, she's like fifth last wheel. Someone splits GC over. I would have yeah. liked to have seen how she would have gone against the two Trek riders, but yeah, Trek just pacing the bottom and then stop and Faulkner right. launches Benji. Yeah. I don't know why. That was odd. Um, it, I thought Ziggert was w- in the group, but she wasn't. Was it a complete launch or was it, Pacing because I felt like pacing. she made a bit of a launch, but she kept on pacing for like the first half of the climb. Probably not. First, like no, 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 three k's, three k's. Okay, ten minutes. I was giving her too much credit, <laughs> and then she lost five minutes. I didn't understand it. Um, was it the second that Adrialini took over that she dropped off the back of that group? Yeah, or was there someone it, else making a move before that? No, nah, it was Riolini. So. Faulkner started pacing. I, I don't think she might have just been doing her pace. Maybe she literally had a power number that yeah. she wanted to do for the climb that she thought she could hold and it'd be the fastest she could do. And she actually did do that. And what suggests that is that, yeah, we, in the last K of her pool, about 10 minutes in, the group wasn't thinning anymore. It was staying the same size. Riders were not in single file. And you see Longenborghini gets on the radio, puts the call in, really, and he <laughs> straight to the front. And she does what you should do, which is what Micah does really well. And psychologically, it is 
kills people, especially when um, Micah does it. But really, you need that here. Just first minute, super hard. <laughs> and then you can drop it down a bit. And once riders, you know, because then they just get spat, they lose the wheel, might lose motivation, especially so far from the finish. They're like, holy shit, if they're going this fast now, I can't hold this. And yeah, really, he puts it in a line and just one by one ruins everybody <laughs> except um, <laughs> Pepper Camp and Shackley. We're still 6Ks to go, like on this yep. climb. We still got 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And. Shackley's dropped when Longer Borghini accelerates really and he hops on Pepper Camp's wheel, DSM. So Pepper Camp's in a Trek Segafredo sandwich and then really and he goes back to the front, five case to go, just drills it and Pepper Camp's dropped and we got one, two. Did you think it's hard to tell? I don't think Longer Borghini could have could have dropped Riolini. That's not even a controversial take. Yeah. My hundred percent, there's no chance in my opinion. On the actual climb part, Longo Borghini could have dropped Riolini. I agree. If they stay together, Longo Borghini would take the sprint, I would say. Yeah, for but sure. But Riolini, I don't know. Could she have dropped Longo Borghini on the climb? She was laughing. She it's was more laughing likely, on the climb. It's more likely that Riolini drops Longo Borghini on the climb yeah. than the other way around. But in the sprint, she gets destroyed. But for sure, like... Yeah, on, even on the 2%, you know, section at the end of this climb, like you saw with Ida Marino, she was with yeah. Persico in the last 400 meters and then lost like 10 seconds in the in the sprint because like her and really only like 40 kilos and, you know, the bike is like it's just so unfair, the 6.8 kilo rule on these riders. It's the bike is like 16% of their body weight. It's yeah. ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I think... Looking at the numbers, again, there's a nice article on this on lanternrouge.com where we have the watts, and it's even interesting for me to see the watts comparison to Van Vleuten. It's not that far off, like, and it's February, and it was a hard stage beforehand. It wasn't easy. They didn't walk up to the base, especially for Riolini. Yeah. Riolini did 10 minutes at, a higher, at higher watts before the climb, <laughs> Than any 10 minute period on the climb. She did five and a half watts per kilo for 10 minutes yeah. to stay in the bunch before the climb. Because as I said, like she's just getting buffeted on the flat. So credit to her for staying in the group <laughs> throughout the crosswinds. Yeah. With also no one's going back for Riolini. Well, if actually, she gets dropped. Loretta Hansen, well, it was in stage four. So maybe not at stage two yet. So Riolini must have done a lot in stage two to hold on and might not have had the support that she might have had on stage four in rough section. Yeah. So I agree. Correct. But we're it, going into the final stretch. We've got these two riders. And what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Because like, for me, it, it seemed pretty obvious. I was like, okay, should Trek give the victory, the stage victory to Gaia Riolini instead of Elisa Ngoborghini to reward her for the domestique we're on the climb in similar fashion that we see in men's Paris last year where Laporte got the victory from Primoz Roglic and Wout van Aert. Now, the catch is, they're so close in GC to each other that Ayalini would take GC with the bonus seconds over Longo Borghini. And personally, I don't give a fuck if Longo Borghini wins this race or not because her palmarès is from here until the ocean from where I live. So she's won so Monuments. much stuff that <laughs> this would not move the needle winning UAE Tour. So with that decision, I would have been like, Realini should have it and let her take both. I don't care. Even if, even if you just want to say give the stage, it's fine. Just give the stage to Realini. And tomorrow, just have Realini hop off the bike with 50 minutes to go and have her walk the last 50 meters. Like, just so she would lose time and Longo Borghini can take GC. Would be a bit weird, but it would... Take the best of both worlds, but what happened? Yeah, they. I thought exactly the same thing. They're coming to the finish. They're laughing, high fiving. It was great to see. I was like, all right, really, he's going to get it. Like Longo yeah. Borghini came to the front on the flat a bit to pace, and and Longo Borghini takes it. And I don't know. <laughs> I, like uh -huh. I usually, I usually really don't care what teams do, what decisions they make. I don't feel. I'm not emotionally invested in. What they do, I'm like, that's not optimal. That could have been better the way you did that. But I don't really care. But th this is one of the few occasions where I was like, oh, <laughs> I was disappointing. 
um, yeah. to see because, Bitter. yeah, it just and listen, the the writers we 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 could just be projecting. The writers might not care at all. Real any seem to be ecstatic. Um, it's not like Stephen Kreisvike, who has sort of written is a senior writer who's been writing as a domestique for a number of years now who doesn't win very much at the end of, you know, the, the last third of his career, let's say. It's the opposite end, so that's one counter-argument. The other counter-argument could be that in, I only thought of it like 24 hours later, I was like, what if Longa Borghini has a bonus clause in her contract for a World Tour GC victory? Wouldn't surprise me. And really, and he doesn't. And that was the calculation. And then they'll split that cash. I doubt it because if that was the case, Longa Borghini in the interview afterwards wouldn't have said the call came from the car. I don't yeah. think the car was looking at Longa Borghini's bonuses in her contract. <laughs> um, I think GC Longa is Borghini, the reason. It's GC. They wanted Longa Borghini to win GC, which again, it's like, why? Because you decided. <laughs> exactly. No, it's, it's because they decided in a meeting two weeks before. That yeah. long, long beginning with GC, but there's no actual reason why she should win GC oh. over Riolini, apart from that decision you've made back then. Yeah. Really, and the reason I was so emotional about it is because, yeah, like, not emotional. I wasn't crying. <laughs> the reason why I was I actually, angry. <laughs> it's because in cycling, like, when you ask a rider go to the front, and I want you to pace to exhaustion to put the leader in a position to win. 99% of the time, they are going to worsen their result because of that, because of that sacrifice. Yep. And most of the time, they don't really get rewarded for it, really. Yep. And when there is that unicorn situation where Yumbo drop everyone off their wheel in Paranese Stage 1, where Vingegaard drops O'Connor with Roglic in the wheel, where Riolini drops the whole women's world to a peloton off the wheel, you get this beautiful opportunity to reward that sacrifice with an individual accolade. And yeah, I think for team chemistry and whatever, like if they'd given it, listen, really, he's going to be stoked either way. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. But did that, giving that stage to Laporte, which to be honest, I think not great because Roglic needed every second. <laughs> By the end of Paradis, he needed four seconds after <laughs> stage eight. But did giving that stage to Laporte, I don't know, give him a sense of certain feeling? Even if he yeah. would have been happy either way, it kind of hurt. Definitely. And in this situation, it's not as dangerous because they're both a minute up in GC after this stage, regardless of who you give it to. So there's not that much danger as giving it to Laporte at the start of Paris-Nice, for example, in this example that we see in men's cycling last year. Now, I'll be honest, I was just angry. I, I was looking at my screen. I, I, I sat there for 45 minutes looking at my screen with a bitter aftertaste. And I don't know why, because I was super happy for Riolini and Longoborghini. They did a wonderful performance on this climb. But come on, DS. You could have made a decision that was, one, great for PR. Imagine the experienced Italian rider. For PR. That brings Riolini to win so early in their first race together. Like, this would be godlike for PR. And worst case scenario, pretend it's a game of rock, paper, scissors, and it can go viral everywhere. Now, <laughs> I would also say, just next to that, social media just wasn't happy with it. So PR-wise, clearly, is, is an impact. But also next to that, I feel like it's just the right thing to do in the team dynamics. That's my personal opinion. And maybe people disagree. There are some people that say, oh, they should have raced for it despite them riding for the same team. I think that would look a bit weird, but on the other end, yeah, it would be funny. they shouldn't do that. <laughs> nah, if they race for it, do it from 4K from the finish line. So it's actually an equal chance. Riolini could drop Longoborghini or Longoborghini could beat Riolini in the sprint, but not in the final sprint. That just well, that's just a one-sided thing. fight. <laughs> if Riolini was stronger, she's being on trek means she couldn't didn't have the chance to attack Longa Borghini. So she's also, not only is she pulling to, to help Longa Borghini, she's also being denied the chance to actually yeah. attack. If she is, what if she was the strongest? That, that's, that's possible. That's very much possible. But on the other hand, if she's not on track, she's likely not there. 
because the improvement that she had from the team she was in last year to the team she's in now is ecstatic when it comes to equipment and so forth, when it comes to training structures probably, all that kind yeah. of stuff, support, finances. I think that must be so much compared to what she was in in that, I think it was a continental team last year, which she yeah. was in. So that's an immense performance. And then we see a performance that is behind the scenes, not in the first group, which is Merino, which is a rider that, I'll be honest, I... I didn't necessarily have up there to be a top three climber here, but she was in the group with Lippert when the climb started. You spoke about her a little bit earlier. And Lippert, first of all, destroyed the group a bit, and then Merino dropped her, and she kept on going because she finished on 119 from the front. What, what does this mean, like, performance-wise? How good is this compared to Rialini and Longoborghini? About the same, because she probably was in the draw for less time, I would guess. In a, I reckon she would have done about the same lots as Riolini, and she didn't get to sit in the draft maybe on the flatter section. She caught up to Persico and Harvey, uh, their group, and Shackley, who were dropped behind the riolini Longoborghini group. She's a Basque rider, like super lightweight climber. She's on, yeah, a Basque team. Labaro uh, Cucha Fundacion Es Uscari. She had been on Movistar for a, a couple of years before COVID. Um, but she's just one of these riders where, you now listen, maybe she, I don't know what she does. Like, I don't know her life story, but if she, I feel like she's been unlucky that if she came through, if she was real any right now at 21, yeah. everyone's signing her up to a three year yeah. deal because we get Mont Ventoux Challenge. Tourmalay stage, Jabel her feet finish. She's a elite level climber. Put her on Movistar. Is she the second or third best domestique with Lippard and, and Patino and so forth there? It depends. Like she got ruined in the crosswinds, which is different to Riolini. Yeah. So I think she she really struggles on the flat. Um so Saucer. maybe yeah, maybe she's not there to help on those climbs and maybe in the Tour de France fam when it's rolly terrain before the climb could be quite tough for her. Um, but yeah, really good point highlighting that performance, really top climber on a, on a continental team. But yeah, as you said, it's the easiest scouting you can do is it's like the, you don't even need, you just pick a rider in women's cycling who's on a continental team or something like, like a UCI team yeah. who gets some decent results in a, women's world tour race like a one of the top ones against decent competition like a top six or seven or something and if they then move to a trek or an sd works there's about a hundred percent chance they're going to kick on and be much much better next year and really he's going to be that rider so really keen to see where she goes but that was the stage uh gc wrapped up one two for longa borghini and um riolini in reality i don't think there's going to be <laughs> Even though we spoke about it for ages, I reckon both of them are going to be fine from a team yeah, chemistry perspective. Of course. <laughs> I don't think it matters at all. <laughs> stage four then, sprint time again. And this was the, the boring stage. <laughs> Let's be honest about it. I, I tuned in a few times before the actual sprint, but I realized quickly enough that no echelons were happening until suddenly we arrived at a stupid bridge over water with a bit of wind. Or was it wind? Was it just the gradient of the bridge? And we see a Movistar duo attack by Lippard and Norsgaard, which I wasn't expecting, but hey, I'll accept it. Longo Borghini closed that. In the meanwhile, Rialini was at the back of the peloton, being held in the group by Loretta Hansen. So now she had that support to try and keep her in at all costs. And uh, we were heading towards a sprint there. But um, we had one problem. The two best sprinters of stage one and two were in a goddamn terrible position with 500 meters to go. <laughs> we were <been> call. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't happy with that Norsgaard move again because it's like Lippert's had a chance for GC for three stages. Yeah, she's two and a half minutes back. Like, why is Norsgaard like Lippert can do that if she wants? But I really thought they should have been setting up the train and Lippert leading out Norsgaard yeah. with fresh legs. Um, and Norsgaard ends up coming fourth in this sprint, so she still was planning on contesting the sprint, and she's doing this. It's I don't know, um, but yeah, I wouldn't wouldn't have done it personally. FDJ were actually pretty prominent under the the Flam Rouge, and then Lippert and Norsgaard were in good position. But yeah, DSM 
they mainly had Georgie. She did a really good job, but she got detached from Charlotte Cool, who was in literally in Narnia. Like she is <laughs> ducking and weaving. There's no extended overhead. It's a. Cr- I wish if it exists, I'd like to see it. Crazy from Charlotte Cool from like 500, 400 meters to go. She's ducking and weaving. Five for Georgie looks back once, twice, sees Vibas is on the wheel, doesn't see a DSM Scott helmet, and she's like, nope, I ain't leading you out. It just stops, <laughs> and then Vibas is triggered by maybe Ponfolonieri or DeZota um, on the other side of the road, so she just launches her sprint way too early, and she's got riders in the wheel. Uh, I think Norsgaard in the wheel. Charlotte yep. Cool goes thread of death. Underneath Norsgaard on the barriers, slingshots into the Ibs wheel, and then comes out and wins easily with Consoni actually coming second, just continuing her sprint ahead of Vibas. So 2 1 to Charlotte Cool. The yep. team were G'd up. Everyone was exactly, excited. Yeah. I think the Swanua was borderline crying. So DSM got to be pretty happy with this week. Yeah, certainly. And looking at the sprint, I'd say that both DSM and both SD Works didn't have the perfect lead out here. Because Cole and Weavers were in a terrible position. They were both uh, just on the other side of the planet by the time the sprint started. But they found their way towards the front by themselves. I think Cole used the wheel of Weavers for a bit. But then a bit later, a few riders came in between, like you mentioned, like Norsgaard and so forth. But the sprint by Weavers, she launches at, what is it, 210, 220 meters? Which, that's too far for any sprinter yeah. in these sprints in, in the last four days, we've noticed that it's always 120, 130 meters in these sprints. And 210 is too far. And we see that in the numbers that I've spoken about so far. So in comparison, very shortly, stage one was 950 for 10 seconds. Stage two was 1040 for 10 seconds. And the peak of those was 1100 and 1200. And now we come into stage four. And it's just a much stronger sprint. 1100 watts, not for 10 seconds for 15 seconds. So that proves how long she had to keep the sprint. And she's still above 1,000 watts if we consider the last 20 seconds there. So it's a very long sprint, let's just say. She had to sprint at least six to seven seconds in my, is my guess, too long compared to her normal sprint. And the peak here is is 1,285, which is again, 100 above stage two. So significantly stronger sprint, significantly earlier sprint. And she burned out by the time she reached the last... 50 meters. And the meanwhile, Cole has the same advantage as stage one, where she uses draft of Norsgaard. She has to spend a bit of energy, I'd say, from switching between Norsgaard's wheel and then switching to Wibis's wheel, because you still have to close the gap a bit, but you are using the draft still. And then she can just slingshot past Wibis again. So a bit of a similar advantage in stage one. And I think there was someone that tweeted something at me today, and it really struck something with me. The sentence was very simple. Last year, Wibis could afford to mess up her running and still win. Those days are gone with Cole around. And I feel like that's very, very correct in this situation. Because in stage one and stage four, Cole has a direct advantage, in my opinion, when it comes to her positioning. Even though she comes from a worse position, she can use the draft to launch past Wibis in both occasions. So I personally, despite it being a 2 1 4 Cole here, would say that as a sprinter, I rate Wibis still faster. Then Cole. But it's a very tense margin to the point where any mistake from Weavers makes it that Cole can win the stage. Yeah, it's much more exciting. I'm looking forward to the sprint stages in the Tour de France farm or before then throughout the year, like even Achant Wevelheim, Shell de Preis, Brugge de Pana, like Balsamo, Cole, Weavers. It's going to be a big showdown throughout the year because Balsamo, she can also get the job done um you know in the right circumstances maybe not as fast as either of these two in a pure bunch sprint i don't think but she is capable of winning them particularly if there is some hills or something beforehand and she's got better fatigue resistance than those both those riders for sure but yeah that was uae tour recap gc longer borghini and Riolini take out the top two spots with persico third all italian podium then shackley shabby Mikel, harvey pallet and pepper count lippet mailing now there's no uh, Cavalli on the top 10. And listen, there's no Van Vlerten, no Vollering here, but still decent field. And yep. yeah, Trek good race onto the sword. And a really good race. Yeah, it was good sprints, nice queen stage, 
crosswind action for four stages. Pretty solid racing, I must say. Yeah. Uh, and I enjoyed I enjoyed watching it. Yep, quite certainly. There's one more thing I want to add where we spoke about Guarishi being the better lead out on stage two, for example. I feel like Georgie showed in stage four that she's up there as well with that move that she decided not to lead out Weber's because Guarishi was basically leading out ahead of ahead of uh Far for Georgie without Weber's being on her wheel. So it's kind of like Georgie made a really clever decision here, and it's kind of making it closer again between the two for me personally after this UAE tour. And there's plenty of races to come where she can prove otherwise. Quarishi, if she disagrees that she's on equal terms. But hey, some stuff happened in men's cycling as well. Rowan Dennis is retiring. Yeah, surprise announcement. He announced on Instagram um, that he's this will be his last year as a professional. He kind of took a really impressive, well, not kind of, he took a really impressive victory in the Tour Down Under uh, stage two and went to the leader's jersey for the day before uh, Corkscrew earlier in January. Now, he's been cycling, he's 32, so it's like, oh, he's, you know, he's still young and he's still good. And physically, yeah. Dennis, still very, very good. Still, I'd like to see his, you know, how he compares to his, like, BMC days, but he's still... Really, really good, but I like a lot of these 1990 guys, which is Pino, I think, you know, they've been cycling at top levels since 2009, 2008, virtually, um, as a basically a professional. So it's still a long career, 13, 14 year career, 32 wins on the docket, only not all of them are TTs, but a lot of them are world tour wins. And he's won a Tour de France stage. Uh, Giro stage, of Welter stage, World Championships in the TT. So, yeah, were you surprised to see this, Benji? Yeah, I think from – from I'm really stretching my memory here, but I swear on Instagram, like two years ago, he asked about uh, water rights or water, water tenements for land holdings in South Australia. So I got a, I got a feeling – I got a feeling he was going to open up his own vineyard or start growing – wine i think that's my guess i believe you i truly believe you it was kind of a surprise for me because while he didn't get his grand tour last year he was sick before the tour de france if i recall correctly now going into 2023 i was kind of feeling like oh good start at santa sur and under what will this give for the other races throughout the season you know will this be able to give him another role in a, in a Grand Tour, but it didn't seem like that because he didn't really fit in the teams that I saw in front of myself for the Giro and the Tour. And, hey, he's making he this decision. He fit in the Giro team? You wouldn't put him in the Giro team ahead of Michael Hessman? I think he fits, but I don't think I'll put him in there because they've got a Trotnik in there in a similar fashion, which will take that role. So, I don't know. I mean, I, ain't, I don't think they got seven guys better than Dennis on top shape for the Giro. Now, where That's they true. take him is another question. So that that doesn't mean they'll necessarily take him. So I don't yeah. know what's – yeah, I'm surprised. I thought – I agree with you. When I saw the TDU result, I thought we were going to see a big contract year performance and, yeah. in the you know, some crazy pull on the Swiss mountain stage in the Giro, like for Gagenhardt on the Stelvio in the back end of that Giro. Um, but – not to be. He's retiring. But um, I also yeah. felt like when it comes to Dennis, we've seen him like switch teams like every single year, basically. So it's not necessarily surprising that he would have left the team anyway at the end of the year was my thought. I was expecting that to happen. But yeah, I don't know. I well, thought he was well, going to go to Jayco. It's a possibility. But well, by the way, what's these Instagram posts like? Because like, I'm blocked by Dennis on, on Instagram. I don't know why. I've done nothing wrong to this man. I love Rohan Dennis as a cyclist. And hey, he doesn't like me apparently. But about that, like, didn't he post like random stuff about like professionalism and so forth the last few days? Yeah, I don't know what's going on. They are a bit odd. It seems They seem very pointed. Um, yeah, I feel like he's yeah. trying to like make a point or something. Yeah. Anyway. anyway. <laughs> no, I thought he was going to go to Jayco. They got a brilliant TT set up. They got Matthews that they could have done with another Australian top rider. 
They could have targeted World Championships TT, put all their energy into him and Olympics TT in 2024. So I thought that was coming. Um, yeah. But not to be. Nope. He's retiring. Anyway, other news is Arno Dali is still a beast, but <laughs> we don't know his schedule exactly. There was like Belgian reports that what Lotto were tossing and turning about where to send him, whether to yeah, do Omloop were... or not. It's pretty obvious, right? Like the dude climbed up Mont Bouquet <laughs> faster than half of the peloton. I'm sorry, and... who else are they sending? <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Come on, don't Seriously. don't do Pascal in corn like that, man. Come on. Okay, Pascal's a nice is nice, but like I think Jasper de Boys maybe he can go to Le Semin and Arno Dali can do on loop. <laughs> it would be if I, yeah. But he's not gonna win it. He can just attack and be there. So Arno Dali is clearly a rider that can win it in the ballerini style of 2021 if it's not the most selective Mur van Gerard's betting which it usually isn't it's kind of like last year it wouldn't have been a, a very selective omloop if it wasn't for Wout van Aert riding away before Bosberg <laughs> yeah I mean Astana split it up on the Mur in 2018 depends how cold and windy it is if it's sunny and, and not windy it's yeah. hard for it to be selected there's no Molenberg last year yeah, the parkour has become easier before Muur van Gerard's betting, and Muur van Gerard's betting in itself is not enough to make the race hard enough to not make a yeah. group sprint possible. So I know the league can win Omloop if he goes, if the race goes his way. What about San Remo? Because Ewan's going to be targeting it, but I don't see those two as particularly compatible in San Remo. And the worst part is, what if they both make it to like the front group? And there's one rider riding away like a certain Kranderson or something. What will they do? Ewan is not going to pace for another league. Zero percent chance, yeah. <laughs> I think if I was actually... If Ewan's in actually good shape, I would make Dali <gasps> sacrifice for Ewan. I would make, you, I would make Dali lead out Ewan. Not because it's necessarily the right thing Get to do. Out. Just no, it's just a dilemma. Okay, so your you're alternative ass is to, Australian. <laughs> no, but I'm just accepting the reality that Ewan <laughs> will not work for Delhi. So you're right, you're right, you're right. It's the only way to to get to, to make it work. Otherwise, you just don't send one of them. And if you don't send Ewan, well, <laughs> good luck getting him to score points for you at um, <laughs> any other race. So. And Dali's young and probably happy to just do it. Whereas, of course, it's not the right thing to do. But yeah, it's just the reality. I would have to leave, lead him out or chase it back. Or just go with the move. I understand where you go, but my Belgian genes want you to want to completely disagree with you. But I, <laughs> Because I believe I know Lee can do better. Of course, he can win. <laughs> <laughs> I would have him... Go with Sturvin and Sir and Krasmuth. He gets the freedom after Poggio to do that if he makes it. Yeah. Okay. Imagine. Do you think going he could with Sturvin and Sturvin will lead him out? For sure he would. Sturvin's <laughs> like, I'll ride for third, baby. I'll ride for fourth. Like he didn't have available him. Mads Pedersen's in the group behind. Is he any good in sprints? I'm, not, I'm Jasper Sturvin, though. I'm paid more than him. Um, do you think Dali could go with? A Wavana Pagacha Al Philippe move on the Poggio? If he I don't know. A I don't think it's dif it's difficult. Because the Poggio is a special one, eh? Positioning is very important. And can they positioning position both you and the Lee because they can't do it in sprints? Can they do it of the Poggio? I think the Lee can riders. do it. I think the Lee can do it. I think uh, he can go I with them. In Almeria, his position was awful going into the last, oh, really? last, last 200 meters because he had to sprint like past 10 people and then almost almost got shoved into the ground by Walshite. Not not deviously, but they just bumped into each other. But hey, like, I don't know. Those Spanish I... finishes have been mental, though. <laughs> last yeah, week. that's true. <laughs> Some have been outrageous. <laughs> More like, free, like, like, a... <laughs> with, like Turner also... was too scared to celebrate, even with his face during his win. When he crossed the line, he was just like, holy fuck. 
<laughs> there was also uh, like was one Murcia. one one race where it was like um like I bet there's more like hairpin corners in the last kilometer in that one sprint stage than there was on Alpe d'Huez. <laughs> That's actually insane. But hey, we yeah. were laughing about it, but people can have accidents and, and crashes as a consequence of these shitty parkour. So something should be done about it. But hey, hey, what can we do about it? We can only laugh at our misery at this point. I think one thing to, now that we're in wrap-up mode, to really note is that there's been the quick starters. And then there's been the slow starters. So FDJ and Jumbo Visma clearly couldn't give less of a, you know what, about (laughs) most of the races to date because they've barely attended any that they don't have to. Uh, They've got guys on Tade or wherever training at the moment. Uh, Whereas teams like Antomarche have probably, because of decisions made before winter and then implemented during winter retraining have started really hot and for Antomarche I think that's a pretty good idea because why not peak for the races you can win get runs on the board and I think they're leading still the UCI points and that then puts you in a much better spot for the rest of the season um they got six wins already which is and I'm not sure any world tour level, but they only had 24 only. They had 24 last year. I thought they'd have less, but <laughs> in a month, they already have a quarter of it. So that's terrifying. Um, DSM also seem to have started pretty hot uh, as well. UAE have sent riders to a lot of races. They've even sending teams without their, <clears throat> excuse me, without their full complement of riders because they're sending them to so many races. They're doing like, Every possible race, Almeria, um, Figuera Champions Classic in Portugal, Oman, and so they can't even send all their runners, so they are racking up some points as well. We'll see, whereas Yumbo, they're in, Yumbo in the relegation zone, so I might get fired. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're always welcome to, um, to continue the podcast if you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might have to fire myself. Um, but yeah, they got, they got to pick it up. They got to pick it up, that team. Them and FDJ, no good. All righty. <laughs> That's all from us on this UA Tour recap and the general news segment. What do we got next, Benji? What do we got next? UA Tour, no? Men's? UA Tour men's. And maybe some wrap-up from Andalusia if if Poggy goes crazy or anything happens. But, yeah, that's next. Um, thanks for listening as always. Thanks to Zwift. And we'll see you in the next one. Ciao.